Okay, thank you everyone for joining us for today's um, talk. Uh, we'd like to start uh, uh, the session by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Ashinabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene peoples, and on the homelands of Metis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we ded dedicate ourselves to move forward in a partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. With that acknowledgement, we would like to start today's session, joining with Omar Abel. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce a good friend of ours, Omar Abel, uh, today's speaker. Uh, Omar is an inventor, I would say, and designer in, in a multi-scalar inter-categorical operation. He's making his base on deep curiosity, I would say, and research focused on properties and prop, uh, processes of material and context. He's one of the two co-founders of Bocce and he's creative director of OAO, an architectural office. Although as he discussed with me briefly, um, he doesn't really see the difference. It's more how you frame the output, but uh, in his mind, everything is sort of intercategorical sort of operation. Originally from Jerusalem, he is currently based in Vancouver Omar is trained as an architect and is a, has apprenticed with Catalan architect Eric Marias and John Paco in Vancouver. He's a recipient of 2010 uh, Rontam Award, Early Design Achievement, and also 2015 RARC Allied Arts Medal. With that, uh, welcome Omar Bell. Hi, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. I um... I, I put together, I cobbled together, um, let's see here. Um, oops, why was this right now here? Um, I cobbled together five projects for you to see. And I don't know if we'll have time to go through them all. So I'll just begin. And if worse comes to worse, we can get, uh, I can get cut off before I reach 91. We, um, we number our projects in chronological order, starting with uh, one in 2005. And now we're working on project 114 or 115. But I've selected these, these five for you because they offer a sort of broad perspective of the kinds of activities that we're involved in. Um, in terms of context, the way they're presented to the world, some of them are buildings, um, some of them are artworks, and some of them are products. And so you'll see, yeah, yeah I've, I've selected some examples of each one. And some of them are sort of both or neither. Um, but the, the underlying theme that we try to incorporate into all the work is this idea that form is born from a material's intrinsic chemical, mechanical, or physical properties. Um, and our, what we see our role to be is, is inventing process. We, we invent ways of making things and intentionally open-ended such that the, that the method itself is the, is the form giver to the pieces. Um, and so we are often surprised by the forms we make and they're not necessarily beautiful and we're okay with that and, and sort of we roll with the material as it were. I'll start with 64. Um, it's, uh, and I'll just be describing how the pieces are made. Um, I'll sort of, these are videos, so I'll, I'll skip ahead because we don't have a lot of time. In this case, there's beeswax and we melt it. That's the first step. Um, and then we uh, also at the same time um, smash up large blocks of ice using a hammer. Uh, so now we have chunks of ice and we have hot wax. Take the shards of ice, put them in a plastic bag. Uh, and that goes into a sort of drum with a, a central core that's hidden away or masked as it were, fill it with cold water and then spin it. Now it's this, you see here, this is a Home Depot drum. This is the prototype, but we now have a very fancy mobile machine that does this, that's on wheels that we can ship around the world. So there it goes, it spins, but you can already imagine what's happening. It's the centrifugal motion of the drum carries the threads of hot wax to the extreme uh, exterior of the drum and they're cooling as they 
um, as, they, as they're pulled out. And so of course uh, they make these very fine tendrils and we melt the ice uh, by running the whole thing uh, under water for a while. You can sort of see how delicate they are. They're almost impossible to touch without destroying these pieces. They're super, super, super delicate. And uh, at first this was like a kind of a challenge in the sense of like, okay, how do we uh, move it around the world, let alone just from one side of the room to the other without breaking it? Uh, because they're so, so, so delicate. Um, and so we invented this method of, of moving them, which is to refreeze them into huge blocks of ice and then, uh, and then ship the, the cubes of ice around the world. And there's a, quite a sophisticated um, logistics uh, network around the world for, for restaurants, for, for shipping meat and fish, frozen goods. So it's quite easy to ship a huge block of ice um, to another part of the world. And, and so the people who commission these pieces receive this funny block of ice, and then they have to wait three days for the water to melt, and then they have their candle. Oh, it, I should say it's a candle. I didn't say that before. Um, and the piece arrives intact in most cases. And then when it's burned, it's kind of, that's my favorite part because it just melts and disappears completely. So the entire, the entire project, including the making of it, the shipping of it, and the use of it is all, it is just an ephemeral sort of ritual of transformation, a sort of dance between water and, and, and wax um, and fire. And at the end, there's nothing left. Um, so that's kind of, uh, that's 64. Um, 71 is, um, so 71 is, uh, is, is probably still my favorite thing that we've ever done. Um, this is what the beads look like. There are no, numerous pieces like this that are strung together with a cable. This is about 100 millimeters in uh, length, approximately 60 wide. And you can sort of see that it's, there's, you can sort of perceive the, the dark parts of the image, the kind of coil, and that's copper, that begins its life as a copper cable that's wrapped around a machine bolt. So the machine bolt's made of steel, there's copper cable that's haphazardly wound by hand around it. Um, and then we just simply, we use a, a very, our take, our sort of like hack, let's say, of a, a conventional electroplating process. And so if you've ever played with uh, iron filings and, and magnets, you'll know that an electromagnetic field forms this kind of lemon shape um, between the north and south poles of the magnet and the, the two ends at the north and south poles are open-ended, almost like a, a candy wrapper sort of shape. And that's exactly what happens inside of a, an electroplating um, uh, sort of tank. Except for in our case, we, we supercharge it with a lot more juice than uh, is recommended. And we have our own um, proprietary solution of, of emulsified metals. And then in the beginning, we used to dip them as you see, as you see Caleb dipping them here. Uh, and, and we literally had to dip them thousands and thousands and thousands of times um, over the course of, of months um, in order for the pieces to sort of accrete. Um, but now we have a robot that does it. Um, and you sort of see they have sort of dry and then they get re-dipped. There's a sort of like um, iterative process that these things undergo. And the cool thing that, that happens is that the electromagnetic field, instead of being that perfect lemon shape that you saw, is a strange shape. And that's simply because the, the cable is, is, is wound by hand as opposed to sort of perfectly. And so the, what's happening inside these tanks is that the, um, the nickel in this case, or any metal we use, is being drawn to the extreme ends of that weirdly shaped electromagnetic field. And over uh, literally hundreds of thousands of iterations, it acc accretes in this pretty interesting way that we, that we love. Um, and and, and a, a sort of cool byproduct of this process is that the, the center of the machine bolt remains hollow because the, the, nickel, the, the nickel molecules are being drawn away from it. Uh, and that uh, nicely allows us to string them into um, with stainless steel cables into these sort of necklaces or garlands, which we uh, which we hang in a room as artworks, as pieces of sculpture. Um, they have a sort of lovely uh, sort of feeling to it. Once in a while, you sort of, sort of see the hexagonal heads of the machine bolts still making themselves known. This is one of my favorite images because you can see that the electromagnetic field was so strong that it sort of pulled the the copper uh, uh, cables away from the coil. And then you can even see like little nodules growing at the very extreme ends. Um, recently, we thought the technique was so interesting that we, we've applied it to gold and silver to make jewelry at a much smaller, finer scale. So here's a gold ring 
and a silver bracelet. 75 is actually really uh, intimately related to, to your school um, because it's, uh, it's the first sort of house that we've built that, um, that has a relationship to process. And, it's, and it was, originally it was inspired by Mark West, Mark West's experiments with fabric forming. Um, and of course that makes sense in the context of our practice because if we are looking for um, methods of, a, of finding form that are true to a process, in the sense of concrete, there's nothing better than fabric forming. So we love it. And since then we've explored other methods as well. And we, we have some projects underway that push this even further, not with fabrics, other, other weird organic ways of forming concrete. But I don't think I have to explain to you how the critique that I have about concrete being, you know, a, a dynamic fluid plastic material that we always see in these sort of, we cast into rectangular plywood, generally speaking, orthogonal systems. And there's a kind of disconnect between what the material, how the material behaves and how we, for, the, the, the forms we make with it. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of inefficiency. I think you being from U of M understand that perfectly. So we started, we started being uh, just kind of playing around with spandex, which is like our version of, of the, the cast experiments. Um, these are pants, these are like spandex pants. Um, and then I went to this antique store that, that had a fresco in the ceiling. This is in New York. And I saw this, um, they were restoring this fresco and they had this fantastic uh, shroud to protect the fresco. And so we sort of put those two things together into a form that's kind of a fluted, these are still experiments in plaster, a fluted um, columnar sort of reverse trumpet shape, uh, which we thought was kind of interesting. And then we sliced it. And this is the best part because it revealed the sort of interesting uh, variegated edge. Um, we thought they would be interesting, these fluted forms, if they were hollow and acted as planters for mature trees. Um, and we ended up just uh, trying to make one. This is for a client and, and the sort of deal with him was we'll make one and see. We couldn't promise how much it would cost or how long it would take or even what it would look like. So we agreed to make one and if it were a success, we'd make more. And if not, it would just be kind of sculpture in the garden. But here you see there's uh, plywood ribs and there's a geotextile that's stretched between them in the center that you saw, I think, uh, a conduit and drainage for the tree. Here's a large foundation. Um, I'll sort of skip ahead because we don't have that much time. But you sort of sort, sort of understand the, the way it's made. It's quite low tech. In future iterations, we hope to replace the plywood ribs with uh, um, a steel system that's reusable. Um, and the concrete's being poured in. Now, the thing that's not clear here is that the, the concrete actually aggressively impacts the fabric as it enters. Um, and it's, you don't sort of see it because there's so much, too much sort of plywood in the way, but, but the, the black portion here is actually kind of bulging out quite intensely, um, uh, making these sort of fluted forms and, and the capillary, um, action of the, of the water and the concrete kind of comes through the weave, which is, uh, a good thing. It releases the sort of tension of it. Um, anyways, so that's that. We made one. Um, and then this is what it looks like. Um, this is really literally from my my phone, this footage. Um, so it's not really professional. This is these sort of awkward and, and aggressive sort of garlic or onion bulb sort of feeling things. And, and we love them and our client loved them too. Um, and so we got uh, the approval to design a house using this method. Um, and we did, we, we, we basically thought that the, that these, what we ended up calling lily pad, uh, lily pads, we, we designed a house made of nine lily pads. Essentially, they were the structural system and the roofing system for this house, each one crowned with a, a mature tree because the, there's, there's so much soil The you know, typically green roofs, there's only two feet of growing medium, but in our case, we had upwards of seven, eight, sometimes more, um, and so we could we could transport quite mature trees directly into place. And we thought it would be wonderful to sort of um, establish a section where we have these varying heights of these lily pad forms, and you're always sort of passing over and under them. Um, we couldn't dig because um, the water table is quite high in this location, so there's kind of it was cost prohibitive to to go down into the soil. And so we just just developed a section that was kind of um, used the datum of the of grade as a as a sort of base point. And in every case, we worked on this idea that there's a foreground, a midground, and a background. Um, we buried some of the project. Here you see 
the um, what we call the winter garden, uh, which is where you enter the house, and that's the first lily pad in the in the foreground. In the mid ground, you see um, the dining room and kitchen below, and the outdoor dining room above. And then far beyond, you see the stem of the living room column. So you see this kind of sequence or, or cadence of, or, or of sort of a cinematographic kind of a, approach to space making. Here we've come up the um, mezzanine stair and we are looking down onto that sort of kitchen dining room lily pad and, and um, sort of beyond at the outdoor dining room. Um, the plan. Uh, so here is the plan. I might even annotate this. Um, so you see, you enter here. Uh, this is that first uh, winter garden that I spoke of, the first lily pad, dining room, kitchen, and um, living room. Uh, and then that's the sort of first sort of public wing of the house. Through a door, there's a kid's wing with two kids' bedrooms and a playroom. Um, through another door to the parents' bedroom where there's a large wardrobe, a bedroom, and an ensuite bathroom. Uh, in every case, you can sort of, you see the, um, the dashed uh, sort of flower shapes indicate the lily pad. So there's one in the ensuite bathroom, one in the wardrobe, one in the kids' playroom, three in the sort of um, public areas of the house. You could double back and go the other way. There's a powder room, laundry room, three-car garage, a gym with one big lily pad, and a guest room. Um, you see, see everything is sort of on the ground floor. Uh, up, up above, uh, I mentioned a mezzanine. In the public area of the house, you can sort of come up this stair along the mezzanine. You're sort of hugging the largest of the lily pads and you come out into an outdoor dining room that's sandwiched between the two of them. Um, there's a yoga room and a small office. Uh, so then, let's see here. So that's the plan. The site plan, It's a, it, the, the house is on an agricultural field. So um, it's 40 acres and it's long and skinny like this facing due, uh, due west. Um, so the approach for us was to keep it agricultural and, and we're, we've been suggesting, right now it's a hay field, but we were suggesting switching to lavender or tulips or some very bright color um, would be great. Or maybe even just a stripe, a stripe of lavender among, amongst the hay. Um, but at the moment, it's hay, and, and our approach to, to citing it has been to imagine that as almost a carpet. We were inspired by this uh, image. This is a painting by Edward Hopper. And you see how the agricultural field comes, abuts onto the, to the, to the house without any kind of transition whatsoever. There's just literally the field touches the walls of the house, and you see also some, some trees in the background. This sort of evoked exactly the feeling that we were after. And so we, we took the agricultural field and literally wrapped it as if it were a carpet over these lily pad forms, always considering that, that they are like artifacts in a sense. So almost the treatment of, uh, of them has been a kind of almost archeological approach where we imagine that we found them there, that they are relics of some unknown construction that's been there long ago. And our role is to sort of frame them, some of them, and some of them remain outside and then wrap this sort of earth blanket over them. Here's a, a video of the site taken uh, during the pouring of the two largest lily pads. So on the right and left of the screen, you see the living room one and the winter garden one. In the center, you see the concrete truck pumping. And uh, we'll be zooming out. And there's two reasons why I include this, this video. One is um, to give you a feeling of the flatness of the site uh, and the sort of field-like nature of it, and also how it's surrounded by a uh, sort of forest. And the second reason is to convey the mood of Vancouver, which is often gray. It's, it rains eight months of the year here, and the sky is often sort of cloudy. And so there's a kind of language that's developing of, of gray concrete, and we clad the house in, in gray cedar, and the sky is often gray. And so the, the trees that we imagine planting in the lily pads, we wanted color. So they are going to be um, flowering magnolia trees, big, big bursts of pink and white uh, for three weeks of the year in the spring. And so that's this one is uh, on the roof of the living room. Uh, this one is the um, roof of the um, kitchen lily pad, which also shades the outdoor dining room. Um, and, and then when we, whenever we need them, uh, we have these retaining walls cast in the same technique. 
Um, for elevation, there's, as I was just describing this kind of framing approach, I used to live in Rome and, and um, there was these beautiful situations where, you know, they'd be excavating for, to construct a, a banal bit modernist building, like an office tower or something like that. And then they encounter in the excavations, a piece of an aqueduct or something. And the building, building code stipulates that as soon as you encounter a worthwhile relic of ancient Rome, you have to stop everything and immediately frame it in these kind of mini museums. And so you have this amazing moments of these sort sort of aggressive chunks of antiquity wrapped in these perfect modernist boxes. And then I loved it. I, I love the sort of dis jarring disjunction of the two. And so here we we try to do the same with a, a sort of modernist cedar box wrapped around these um, these kind of concrete forms. Uh, there's a, uh, an acknowledgement of how the sun would interact with it. Here, th this horizontal slot is facing west. So you can imagine during the sunset, the sun slashes underneath and reflects down on the underside of one of the lily pads. And then on two sides here, left and right, you see how we've actually offer um, a skylight all the way around the pieces, capturing south light. So in midday, you have, you have them sort of bathed in light and they appear to be floating and disconnected from everything else. Yeah, this is going to be difficult to explain because it's only, I only have model images at the moment, but when the finished photography comes out, it'll be more clear. There's a, a, a wood liner on the inside of the plan, which is made of uh, uh, white oak dowels. And that's um, a sort of veil that, that uh, we wrap these con aggressive concrete lily pads with. And it, it corresponds also to the same module that we use to clad the building, except for in the exterior, it's cedar. So there's a nice thing that happens where the cedar, which will gray out over time, kind of become the silver wood, um, contrasts with a much richer warm wood on the interior. Um, yeah, I think the, the way to describe this is only with real photography. And I, I've included some construction photography. These are six months old. So by now there's already windows and doors and, uh, and the floor. Um, but in, in a way, I, I love these images more because there's, um, very little scale to them, and they they retain this sort of sculptural quality that architecture has before, before it's um, you know like domesticated by scaled things like door handles or kitchens or these kinds of things. There's kind of aggressive sculptural quality that's lost always, even in in totally banal architecture, that's that's gone as soon as those sort of scale giving elements appear. So for me, these are the most um, maybe uh, interesting images of the project, even though now we'll be shooting it. It's almost finished and we'll be shooting it soon. Those will be maybe more conventional and interesting for other reasons. There, this, is the, this image is good because you can sort of see that over under sort of feeling that I was describing and the framing. Okay, so 87 is a switch in scale. It's a, it's a, a light uh, that, that we developed made of glass. And it has this ephemeral sort of um, opalescent quality that's hard to describe. It's, it's, um, it's achieved by um, layering these sort of um, very fine tendrils of glass in a technique that we've developed. And I'll describe that technique. The, the first step of it is to gather glass and to um, um, impregnate it with huge amounts of air. So this is probably 50% air. We do it by dipping in, uh, the glass into soda water. Um, so I'll, I'll just go back in that there so you can just have this image in your mind. See, the glass is like just jam packed with, with air bubbles. Um, and uh, then we heat it um, to like a, quite a high temperature, basically a pitch, pack it with as much heat as we can and then hang it over and you can sort of see, now I should talk about glass. Glass has got this malleability of more or less like honey. It's, it's kind of syrupy and the hotter it is, the more malleable it is. So as it cools, it, it tends towards the glass that we know, the, the sort of rigid, stiff, um, clear glass that we know. But when it's hot, it's orange and it's uh, liquidy. Um, the next step is kind of like making uh, toffee or, or noodles. Um, and it's just involves taking that hot glass, stretching it over and folding it over itself. 
we do so eight or nine times before the glass stiffens up and it's too hard to pull. You can see that with each passing stretch, the glass is getting stiffer. It's harder and harder to do, and it's also getting less orange. And you can sort of see the development of that opalescent quality. Um, and that's because each one of those air bubbles that you saw before is getting stretched. Uh, its diameter every, in, with every fold is halved. And basically what we're doing is making these increasingly fine tendrils of very, very, very fine glass. Um, the last step is wrapping that um, matrix over a peg, a steel peg, and that gives the, the sort of rubber band form of the piece. But the diameter of the steel peg is also great because that's, that's exactly the diameter of the, of the hardware that later lights up the work. Um, so you see it here. So that these sort of circles just replace that peg. And the form of the piece is, is, is I think it's pretty um, honest to the technique because really it's the way the, the glass drapes after all these folds. Uh, there's very little of our own um, formal intuition goes into this work beyond what it wants to do as part of the process. And I'll end with 91 because I think we still have a bit of time. Uh, 91 is another house uh, and it's in progress now. Uh, the site is um, um, on the Gulf Islands of British Columbia. It's, it's an archipelago of islands that's uh, quite beautiful that, um, that sort of face, uh, face the Pacific Ocean. There's, um, the, I'll describe the sort of various conditions of the site. We have, first of all, a forest, which is our sort of second growth forest. It's been logged in the 50s. So these are sort of 50, 60, 70 year old trees. And you sort of have that typical West Coast forest feeling, but then beyond the trees, you start uh, perceiving the, o the ocean and you sort of see the glimmer, especially um, later in the afternoon, the glimmer of a sunset um, beyond the, the trees. But before you get there, um, there's a sort of escarpment that you crest and then a, a gully, uh, which you see here in, these, in this footage here. So it's kind of a fern gully and you sort of descend, you lose sight of the sun, and then you ascend again and reach the edge of the water, which is a totally different condition again. It's rocky, as you can see, and there are um, these lovely Gary Oaks. These little trees here are um, rare and protected. They're called Gary Oaks, and they have this sort of witchy, gnarly sort of feeling to them, and they're sort of cas cascade into the, into the water. Beyond, you see the other Gulf Islands of British Columbia, um, and, uh, and these sort of long grasses, which are also quite different. So you see in a very small site, we have these very different sort of um, ecosystems. Um, and so the, the sort of, uh, you know, I, we live here in Vancouver and it's like we have a, a very strong tradition of what so-called West Coast modernism. And the, the sort of West Coast modernist approach would have been to site the building uh, parallel to the edge of the water. Um, thus allowing the majority of the spaces to have uh, an interaction with, with, the, um, with the ocean. But we, you know, this is kind of the typical thing, but here's the site section. Um, but we decided to do the exact opposite. We cited it perpendicular to the water with the idea that the house is almost like a, a sectional cut, allowing you to experience each one of those ecosystems that I just described in the video. And uh, effectively the house becomes a bridge over the fern gully, which we also found quite exciting. So um, a person is um, never changes elevation. You never go up or down really when you're in the, in the main part of the house the site goes up and down around you. You begin in the forest, then you find yourself in the tree canopy suspended over the fern gully and finally uh, end in, uh, uh, your experience with arrival at the, at the water. Um, and there's a kind of uh, idea about always traversing over and under the house. The house is basically part of the site. So you're kind of, there's these sort of paths that we inscribed on the site where you're always sort of making a loop, uh, finding yourself entering the house. Uh, I, I hope you see this um, little person entering the house at, at, at so-called grade, forest grade, finding their way to the courtyard, making their way up to the roof, back around through the site to the fern gully under the courtyard, and then back around over to the beach and the living room in the front of the house. So you're always sort of making, weaving all over, all over, over and under the house 
and these particular uh, choreography that we developed. Um, there's also an idea about an interior and an exterior. So the, our clients here are a couple whose kids have left home and this is their house that they're constructing for this new chapter in their life. And so the idea of this house is that there's, it's a house for two most of the time for the two of them, but the house needs to be able to expand uh, when their kids come home or when they invite guests or other family members to join them on the island. And so there's um, a, a sort of series of spaces that are designed, the house is designed to sort of expand with the occupancy. This is, this is the scenario of just two people. You um, enter here um, and you go down this very long corridor that's um, suspended, uh, that's the main bridge form. Um, as you're walking, there are little things on the right, which are basically perceived as, as a sort of like an operable closets. But there are various kind of programs involved. One of them is a coat room. There's a bunk bunk beds for, for kids to sleep in. There's a day bed to read by. There's a, a little laundry area, a bar, a little breakfast nook, and you finally end up with the kitchen. So you see, you've, you've traversed the, the sort of length of the bridge. You look down onto the fern gully and then you arrive at the public area of the house which is a kitchen a living room around a fireplace and a dining room and these spaces have a direct relationship to the to the water along the way you encounter um, a triangular courtyard which forces you to look up or down um, so so this so this experience you can you can sort of um, you can sort of see that there's a that as you're crossing the bridge, this is what you're looking at. You're looking, you're experiencing, you're suspended, you're high up in, in the tree canopy and you're looking down onto the fern gully. When you arrive at the kitchen, you're, you're given the sort of the best part of the site, which is the, the relationship to the water. The next portion of the plan is the master bedroom. So this is still in the two person scenario. You go through a door here into the private part of the house. There's a, a tiny little office facing the water. Uh, an ensuite bathroom and one suspended bedroom. Now, if you remember that we're, this whole house is a bridge, this is more or less midpoint in the bridge. And so that's the sort of most dramatic part of the plan. And the bedroom has a kind of um, incredible view, not only towards the water, but also towards the fern gully below. And then if the kids come home or if guests arrive, we have, um, okay, so yeah, that's the, that's the view from the master bedroom. It's just sort of astonishing. Um, this next blue part of the plan that's shaded shows you what, um, if, you, if we decide to open, if one, if one kid comes home or one guest, basically what happens at this door in the plan, you, you exit the house, so you're outside, if it's raining, you get rained on, and you cross this bridge to enter a little bedroom here that has its own little bathroom. And so that's how the house expands to accommodate one guest or one kid. And this is kind of a nice ritual that we think of at the end of the night after dinner, you have to say good, kind of good night. And then you put on your coat again and, and you go outside only to just enter back in. Um, but you have those 20 seconds of experiencing uh, the, the uh, this little landscape, the smells of it and, and the sort of um, the rain. Um, and so that's the one bedroom and that's the view from that bedroom. And then the final part of the plan is this um, additional wing that we have where if you cross the other bridge here, you enter a foyer space that leads to um, uh, one bedroom here, which has a day bed. The thought is this is for a couple who has a young, a young kid, um, a, a shared bathroom. And then on the other side, um, um, uh, a, a, a sort of another, an additional bedroom that for a while was a bunk room, but later became a kind of bedroom. And so that's the idea for, for guests. Um, I lost my cursor here. Uh, so forgive me a second. Oops. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so um, where was I? And that's the view. That's the view from that sort of guest wing. Um, the interior, I'll, I'll just blast through really quickly. Um, there's, um, there, there's that first coat closet as you're walking down the bridge corridor. 
um, two bunks with the sort of stair. All this is behind closed doors. So this is a kind of a wardrobe feeling and you're sort of opening cabinets to discover that they're not cabinets at all. They have function in them. So this one's the bunk room, uh, the day bed, the laundry area, what we're calling the booth, which is like this kind of cozy booth to play cards or, or board games or have breakfast and the bar. That's the day bed, which could double as a sleeping area for two people foot to foot. Um, there's the laundry area. Um, on the other side of the corridor is basically a sort of an art wall with this mm, particular kind of millwork system that we developed that has closed and open um, portions. You encounter the triangular courtyard halfway through your journey across the bridge. Um, and then you reach the kitchen. There's a kitchen island, um, the dining room with the ocean beyond, and the living room here with the fireplace. That's the little uh, home office and the private area of the house, the ensuite bathroom, and the master bedroom facing the water. A uh, big part of, a, of this idea is the courtyard. So there's nothing better to make you feel like you're on a bridge than, a, than an edge where you look down or up. And so we developed this courtyard in the plan, which um, hopefully corresponds with, I don't think, I think we'll have to fake it. We'll have to probably plant a tree there. Um, but the original intent was to accommodate an existing tree. Construction is just too aggressive for that. Uh, but the, the feeling of looking up at a tree canopy is what we're after here. So when you're at that courtyard in the corridor or in the living room, and you look up or down, you see the fern gully up. This is what you see. Um, and there's a stair there that gives you access to the roof of the house, which is a green roof. Or you can also inhabit the underside of the house, which is a fascinating experience in its own right. Um, here it is, that sort of, sort of feeling here. This is actually images from the site. We love materials as, as, as we've discussed, but wood has been uh, um, quite a challenge over the years because our process-based approach is um, works best when, when the materials are at, in their rawest state. But wood, uh, by the time it reaches our hands, has been heavily processed. Most of the wood that you can get your hands on is dimensional lumber, which has already kind of been uh, treated in all these different ways um, and dimensioned. So we worked with a reductive technique. Here you see this is an aggressive sandblasting um, treatment for a piece of machinery. So it's, a, it's used usually to, to get rust off of uh, pieces of metal in industry. And we just thought that we would apply this aggressive sandblasting to, to wood. Um, and so it's a conventional cedar cladding, but it's very, very heavily sandblasted. And what you can see is, is that the, the sandblasting reveals this very uh, almost mineral quality in the wood um, and the, uh, the changing textures from one piece to another is, is something we love. And originally when we um, began the project, the idea was that we, for window openings and door openings, we would simply sandblast right through the wood to give this sort of um, soft edge. Uh, but I don't believe that our clients are, can really get behind that. So we're gonna have um, rectangular windows in this matrix but just still beautiful, but just a different than what we thought. Um, and then a final note about climate change. The, the siting of this house is also motivated by the idea or the thought that in a hundred years, uh, there'll be, who knows how much water will rise, as many different estimates, but certainly we'll have half a meter of water arise, possibly more. Um, and if so, uh, then there's this kind of magical thing that happens on the site, which is that the fern gully is completely flooded. So the house really becomes a bridge at that point in a hundred years. Um, this is the current uh, uh, sort of level of the water in 2021. And then our projections is, are that in a hundred years, it'll be approximately here. And so then there'll be a completely new different reading for this architecture. Um, and it'll basically be a kind of uh, Gulf Island um, tidal pool, we believe, depending on how much water there is. It might just be water. But um, we think that the water will, depending on how much, will, will create this kind of interesting tidal pool ecosystem under the house. And here are some construction images. You can sort of see the bridge deck going to place around the fern gully. Um, 
some foundations and steel work. And that's it. Wow, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Omar. Um, My pleasure. We'll, uh, we'll open up some, some discussion around the, the amazing uh, projects that you've shared. Uh, I think it's been, uh, it's been uh, about eight, somewhere eight years. And uh, a lot of things have uh, over developed, uh, developed over the time. Uh, it's good to get uh, your update. Um, next, next round, we'll, we'll invite you back in 10 years again. <laughs> and we'll get a, a little update on this house. I think that might be amazing to see whether the water reached the, the, yeah, right. the level or not, right? It would be, be quite amazing. Of course, on top of that, that we see other projects too. Um, I'd like to open up a few, few sort, of, uh, sort of reflections and maybe questions about um, how you work and how you, um, you go through the process. I guess something that we can hinge on is, uh, uh, like I, I was always amazed how you surround yourself with U of M graduates. Uh, you know, recently Apollo joined you and um, other people have worked with you. Now, could you uh, uh, talk a little bit, uh, we, we sort of have a hint of uh, how you process your work, but maybe you could talk about how you work with your team, uh, maybe sure. how you or organize team members around you and how the dialogue yeah. goes through in, in relation to process, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, certainly. So, okay, so uh, my interests are so broad and, um, and so much of what I'm interested in, the only way forward uh, to push projects forward is to investigate um, different kinds of skills materials and you know the old you know the adage which is uh, you need 10,000 hours uh, to become a master at any particular skill and so I'm uh, in my mid-career and I don't have tens and tens and tens of thousands of hours <laughs> to devote to glass and ceramics and architecture and wood and concrete and all these different things I'm interested in so um, the very foundation of the practice is, co is collaborative we, I, I, in order to move any project forward, I must collaborate. I must surround myself with people who have 10,000 hours to spend on a particular uh, discipline and to become incredibly intimate with it. So whether that be glass or ceramics or the skills of architecture or construction or mechanical engineering or any of these things, there's a kind of or, or sales or, or, or uh, economics or you know, any, any of these skills that are part of the constellation of, of people that we have around us. It's a, it's a fundamental, fundamentally collaborative um, environment. So I rely, I rely on my collaborators quite, quite heavily, but there's kind of almost um, a prerequisite of openness, I guess, that everyone, everyone kind of checks their expectations at the door when they come in. Um, and there's um, an acceptance of, of failure as a sort of constant companion. We fail quite a lot, but I don't really think of it as failure in a sense. Like we, we, we make a lot of things that don't really go anywhere and they just go on the shelf and they sit there on the shelf sometimes for years or decades. Um, but they always, there's some, always some kind of redemption later on, you know. <laughs> A, a new a new machine or a new collaborator or a new way of thinking about something ignites an old work back into the stream of the current work. I don't know if I've answered your question. It's a it's a it's a fun place to be. No, that's great. No, I think uh, I mean I I've, I can see sort of um, the collaborative uh, sort of dimension in all the projects that you're you're doing, and and I think it's I mean as you describe your project as honest honest process reveal in a way. I think uh, it also shows not only the material process, but also sort of have a hint, hint of the dialogue that you're having with the collaborators and your clients and all the, all those sort of uh, people who are part of the process. I think that's amazing. Uh, there's a there's a question on on the chat here. Uh, do you find it daunting jumping from product design to building design to art pieces? Now, on top of that question, I would just uh, elab uh, the, uh, on top of the uh, dovetail that question with you know there's project skills from product to architectural space, to, to the landscape, even when you're talking about lily pads and all these sort of things, uh, how, how, do you, how do you navigate these sort of scales and temporal conditions, I guess? That's part of the question. Do you find it daunting or do you find it challenging? What, what, how, do you, how do you feel about that? Um, so my training is in architecture, but I do find, you know, I think that, I think it's like, it comes down to this kind of comfort level. Um, every, every creative person, I believe, has a kind of, comfort level in terms of scale 
Um, and mine ends at the scale of a house. Like I, I, I can, I can work with fractions of a millimeter right up to about, uh, I don't know, 5,000 square feet or something like that. And beyond that, I become quite uncomfortable. And I think that there's, there's other creative people who, who's, who, who actually thrive in that larger scale going all the way up to city planning or infrastructure, you know, those kind of very large works that I, that I have an intrinsic discomfort with. So first thing, the first way to answer that question is to say that I'm in my comfort zone. The small things, the small to intermediate sort of size things are, are comfortable to me. And then as far as, as, um, as process in the, uh, in the studio goes, it's like, there's, um, there are different streams, but in the in the phase of generating ideas, it's just me and my collaborators, and we and we all our entire goal is to make process, to invent process, and and that's um, we don't do it with a brief, we don't have schedule, we don't have any kind of scale. We just make things that we think are interesting, and then once or twice a year, there's a kind of audit process where we sit down with all the stakeholders involved, my business partner, and we decide what are these things that we've made, what do they want to be. This one wants to be part of a building. This one wants to possibly be a light in the catalog. This one is so hard to make and so expensive that it can only live as an artwork. You know, th there's a kind of um, secondary layer of consideration that's applied after the ideas are generated. And so in, in a way there's, um, you know, the conventional process is like the designer or the architect gets a brief and you respond to that brief. But in our case, we have an inventory an archive full of ideas some of them are more developed than others. And we match that idea to whatever opportunity happens to come along. And so, yeah, of course, some of them, I mean, there are different skill sets required when you're developing a product and a piece of architecture, but products and artworks are not that different from each other. The only difference is that one is, um, one is, is produced at, in, in mass and the other one, generally speaking, has a, very, a lot fewer sort of additioned, additioned iterations. And so the only difference there is that you can afford to spend more energy and effort and resources on the artworks than on the products because the products there's, let's say, a thousand of versus three or five. Um, and the architecture is the most complex, to be frank, because those other two areas of a product or piece of artwork can be quite pure in the sense of being about one idea. If you execute an idea quite rigorously, it can make a very powerful object. Um, but with architecture, there's a sort of um, ecosystem of ideas, a hierarchy of ideas. You can't just have a building be about one idea. And furthermore, there are many, many people involved. There's, um, and they all have to sort of collaborate and work. Many of them don't even understand what they're working on. You know, there's a kind of, um, um, orchestra feeling to it. You're like the conductor of an orchestra. And um, there's so many different stakeholders. There's your clients, there's, there's engineers, there's a, a city involved. You have to get permits. The building must function uh, in all these pragmatic ways that are, that you know, a, a, an interior, a product in an interior or a piece of artwork they do not need to, has to keep the water out, has to not fall down. It's a lot harder, a lot harder. Um, but it's the uh, but that's the challenge of this of this decade of work and and moving forward is to to carry that philosophy that we've we've um, refined at the scale of a, an object and see if it if it makes sense as architecture it's a sort of experiment to see can we can we take it to the scale of architecture is it interesting so 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 that's that's refreshing when 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 you talk about uh, having a brief and responding to brief versus having fun with your inventory creation and then trying to curate that into the coming or falling briefs that are coming at you in relation to the economy and, and the temporal dimensions that it, it requires. I think then you're, you're sort of constantly in a curation process of your, your products in relation to the, the brief that is coming through the door kind of thing as well, right? So I think that's quite a refreshing way to think about the process. That's amazing. Um, there's a couple more questions on the, on the chat. I guess the fun, one of the questions that was lengthy in writing is sort of hinting on in the 91, Project 91, in relation to the landscape and the na nature, uh, how do you see it's performing back to or in relation to the nature or surrounding around it, other than the flood, uh, inter uh, the narrative about the flood? But uh, how do you see other, other aspects uh, working with the nature? I guess that's the one, one question. Uh, do you want to respond to that first and then yeah, and move sure. on? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, one of the 
the nice things about a bridge is that it just touches down on two spots. So as far as impact on the site, we're quite limited to those two touchdown points. And we, we all feel that that's quite good um, in, a, in a natural environment like that to have as, as little footprint as possible. Um, and secondly, the the roof is is just a a, a a soil a planted roof. So basically, whatever planted area we displace at grade, we just pop on right on top. Um, and as far as the wood skin of the building, that sandblasted treatment we hope um, will encourage a kind of growth of of lichens and and moss. We don't know for sure, but I think that in in a hundred years, that that house might be have a completely different reading than just as a wood house. It might be a kind of living part of the site. The wood is quite thick, intentionally, of the cladding. Like usually, a cladding is an inch thick or an inch and a quarter. But ours, we intentionally made it very, very thick to give it longevity um, and to encourage that kind of mysterious interaction with the ecosystems involved. So we'll see. Um, but it is fun. It is still a house. I mean, there's, there's no, it's a house for humans that occupy the site. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, a way to regard the landscape. It's not necessarily part of the landscape. I don't know that. I mean, despite our best efforts, it'll forever, it'll, it's a, it's a habitat for, for humans. Uh, mm -hmm. and so there's heating system, there's plumbing, there's electricity, all these things that humans need. Hmm. And that removes it fundamentally from being a part of nature. Right. There's some, some, some sense of honesty to it as well, right? That's, uh, that's nice. The other word that you use in your presentation that's really related to Zach, what Zach is asking here, um, is the word hack. And then you're hacking a lot of things in terms of industrial processes and, and, and the, the, the way we think about the uh, products and uh, the material. Um, I guess the, if I just read the question here, um, what attracts you, I guess, uh, your intention or attraction to repurposing industrial tools and materials to create uh, such a delicate, uh, delicate objects and, 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 and structures. Now, uh, what, what attracts you to that, I guess? What do you attract to hacking these things? I guess that's a Yeah, question. no, okay, so, uh, yeah, so yeah, that's again a kind of like know yourself kind of question. Like I, what, <laughs> I'm, I, just, I just love making stuff. I, I'm really good at, at, I have a kind of intuitive understanding of materials and I don't approach design in an um, academic way uh, or, or critical way. There's very little editing or criticism in our internal process. And so we just love to make stuff. And, and, and so um, whatever industrial process or not necessarily industrial, scientific, craft-based, that we can get our hands on it's just sort of tools tools for us to make form um and as far as the hack goes that's only i mean that's only because most of the techniques that we're interested in have other declared purposes that they've been developed for but there's no i mean there's no there's, there's no rules to this kind of stuff like you you just you just find what you find and and you um direct i guess it's like maybe the right way to answer is to say there's there's shortcuts Instead of, instead of, there's a lot of machinery that's already been developed. It's very good at doing certain things. Electroplating is like a miracle. Like, you know, all these things are, and they're part of our, of the fabric of, of every, of every city's industrial base. This is like, it's, it's kind of amazing. The resources we have at our, at our fingertips without, we don't even think about it, but everywhere you go, you can get involved in all these amazing processes that are just occurring um every day to make very banal objects to me that's very exciting and it doesn't take much to change to change one little thing or or uh or change a parameter and and achieve some pretty fascinating forms do you do you usually start from that kind of um engagement like uh, looking time, at industrial yeah. process okay. <laughs> yeah we, we look for a material or a technique or a collaborator right. a person who knows how to make something a machine that we are interested mm -hmm. in yeah, uh, we'll open up some more questions for the next uh, five, 10 minutes. But uh, when you were pulling those, um, the glass um, poles, I was imagining the, the noodle poles in, in, in yeah. Chinese tradition. Yeah. <laughs> it's very similar to that. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. amazing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I live in Vancouver, right? I mean, there's lots of noodle pooling <laughs> around here uh, that must have been somehow in my subconscious. Megan, do you want to open up uh, your video and then ask you the question? I will also want the audience to meet uh, Omelia as well. 
I was wondering how you get inspired to try all these different techniques and maybe sometimes if you've tried some that didn't end up working out the way that you hoped. Yeah, most of the time, uh, most of the time they don't work out the way I hope, but there's a kind of um, thing that we've cultivated over the years, which is to see, have the eyes to see the thing that you've made, not the thing that you tried to make. Like quite often you're, we're always trying to make something, but it's it's more often than not that, that the process or the material takes us in a totally different direction. And instead of sub diverting it right back to where we think we want it to go, we cultivate um, an environment where we just let it go where it wants to go. And and you're right, quite often they're, they're what, what I call failures, which is not really failures, but the numbering system I described is we skip numbers because there's some of them that are just, they just sit there on the shelf for years and decades. But I really never, we never really throw anything out. Like no idea is ever a dead end. We just, it's just not ready yet. You know, so there's, there's a kind of infinite patience that we have for these ideas. And maybe some of them are like a decade, they take a decade or however long they take and that's okay. Um, so that's another kind of way that maybe like, you know, I, I, I went to the University of Waterloo School of Architecture and there's a, a tradition of critique and criticism and editing that was hammered into us. And, and I guess I've in some ways completely rejected that because we don't, we don't edit at all. And we, <laughs> we don't, uh, we, there is no tradition of critique in our studio. You mentioned briefly about this uh, annual or maybe sort of a routine audit of your own library or your uh, graveyard, however you want to call it. It's like archive, archive. archive, archive. And is that the most uh, sort of um, um, curatorial departure of how the idea starts to become a kind of economical yeah. project of yeah. that sort of thing? Yeah. Okay. And maybe I wasn't um, uh, accurate with the response I gave to to Megan, because because there is there is critique and and there are layers of conventional design thinking that get applied, but only after the idea, the birth of the idea. So we kind of look, we kind of wait until there's a spark or kind of a moment of discovery. What we call a kind of everyone knows it when it happens. This kind of magic that happens, and then, and then from there on, there is that audit I described, and then from there on, the process does become conventional. So yes, we we of course we edit we. We overlay things like technology, 3D modeling, or whatever develop components or whatever we need to do to bring that discovery into a place where it can be part of the world. Um, so, so I, I was referring maybe with the the comment about editing is maybe um, referring to the early part of our exploration, but subsequent parts are are conventional in a sense. We'll take maybe uh, one more question from the audience, uh, but while we wait for that um, questions to arise, um, I wanted to just touch on scale in relation to time, right? So, because you, you mentioned about scale and comfort zone in relation to the type of work that you are comfortable with, but it also seems to me there's a kind of a scale and temporal dimension to your work, uh, with, whether smaller objects tends to take a slightly less time, but by iterating, you're actually delaying its uh, appearance, right? So, so yeah. you're actually making it much more difficult for it to appear for uh, as a product. You're actually delaying the process of the, the making of the smaller object, yeah. <laughs> which I think is quite interesting play of temporal dimension of these skills. Uh, do you have any reflections on that? Or Yeah, they each have their own timetable and mm. we can't rush them. We, I mean, some people say that the output of our practice is quite limited. Like we only come up with a few new things every year. And some of our um, contemporaries come up with like 30 new things a year or whatever. You know, there's, there's quite a bit of um, time that in, we invest in our work and it's, it's low. Um, that is one thing that we just feel comfortable with. And some years we have two things, new things. Some years we have three. Um, and yeah, they all have their own sort of timetable. I don't know. Some of them are fast. Some of them are quite simple, but very slow. And it's um, it's back to that sort of infinite uh, uh, patience comment that I made. There's um, you just have to let them happen, and they sort of they tell you when they're ready. <laughs> well. That's uh, that's wonderful. Now uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, wrap it here around. Um, but thanks for sharing your inspiring work again. 
last time you 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 were here, um, I still remember vividly your. I think it was called uh, cuckoo, uh, cuckoo chandeliers when you were blowing uh, glass blowing and making the the. Is it called cuckoo, like a uh, glass blown um, chandeliers? You were talking about waiting, waiting for that thirty second, or making that decision in thirty second interval when the glass is hardening. You oh, only have very. Resin. Yeah, this is you meant resin. The the two point four chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I, I think I think the the curatorial aspect of your project and practice is amazing. I think that there's a lot to learn and reflect on for us when we think about. Um, the way the conventional practice works, I think I think that's a refreshing reminder for us to think about these sort of uh, processes and informing our outcome through the process rather than just following the brief for the sake of following the brief. I think uh, your project is so inspiring, your process is so inspiring in that. Well, thanks for sharing your uh, project and process with us today, Omer. Uh, and we'll, we'll definitely invite you again in the next 10 years so to get an update again. <laughs> It's always a pleasure. Um, I appreciate the invitation. All right. Well, well, thanks, thanks everyone for attending and then joining us with that conversation with Omer about. Uh, we'll uh, announce for the next announcement uh, following uh, soon. But until next time, Omer, take care. Bye. So, so long. We'll, we'll see you. Okay. Thank so you. Thank you, Omer.